the public square needs our witness. If in all of our communities, it's a moral obligation to just witness subtly, that really is going to allow us to reclaim this great country. Welcome to the Edify podcast, where our guests share practical wisdom on living our faith in public. I'm Mary Fiorito. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Edify podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Kevin Roberts, president of the Heritage Foundation. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Great to be with Thanks you. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. I've been so, looking forward to it. Um, so for those who don't know heritage and don't know what think tanks are, you know, and don't know that people in Washington actually think, tell us a little bit about what you do, what heritage is, and, and the influence that you try to have on uh, the culture and, and laws and policies and things that affect everyday Americans. Given that too few people in Washington think, especially too few elected officials, it's a city with a lot of so-called think tanks. And a think tank, for someone who doesn't know or has been wondering, it's a public policy organization. So we do academic quality research on public policy as opposed to, say, my academic discipline of history. Mm. We're, we're focused on taxation policy, education policy, foreign policy. In fact, the Heritage Foundation is distinctive, if not unique, among right of center politically speaking, think tanks in that we cover every single issue. So mm -hmm. we also cover the social issues of marriage and abortion. And, and what further distinguishes us is that we advocate for those policies. So we don't merely write about these things. We actually cross the street to the Capitol and we lobby our members of Congress, members of the Senate to pass good legislation, kill poor legislation. We're also supported by several hundred thousand Americans. And so I like to say we are the common Americans lobbying arm. Right. Uh, we are common people. We have very smart people there. Right. But I think what has always distinguished heritage over its 50 year history is that we really do see public policy through the lens of the average American mm -hmm. and try to represent that position in Washington. Oh, that's fantastic. Because, you know, everybody needs a voice. And I just think you know, there seems to be voices for people at, at either end of the spectrum, but it's all the people in the middle that often don't get their, their voices heard. And one of the things that St. John Paul II said about combating a culture of death with a culture of life is that you must stand with in radical solidarity with the woman. Now, public policy, you know, things can have prudential judgment features to them, but what at Heritage do your scholars or, or do you personally see as ways that we can now change the culture to be in that kind of radical solidarity with the woman? Well, I'll get into the, the more policy academic side of that momentarily, but I think it might be helpful for me to relate a story that was telling for me as a lifelong pro-lifer. Mm. I remember about 15 years ago, I, t I organized the first pilgrimage of students from a school that I started aptly named after our patron, John Paul the Great Academy. And we were in Washington for the march. And what struck me was a lot of very graphic pictures yeah. and a lot of rhetoric. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. There were a few. It's just that it really stuck out. Right. So 99% of the people there were in solidarity with right. the woman. Right. It's just that that 1% really stuck in the minds of those students. And I went home thinking, well, this was a success for the sake of the march and for the sake of the issue, but it wasn't a success for these students mm -hmm. because they felt, to John Paul II's point, yeah intuitively, because they all have moms, right? right. That that just wasn't right. right. But the good news, to sum up this story, Mary, is that you fast forward just four or five years, those people weren't there. And hopefully those, those yeah. folks actually had a change of heart, right? right. And we're at the march right. using better rhetoric, not using these pictures, because it, it was students who told me, Dr. Roberts, this is just a much better march than the one that we were right. on prior. I like to think that heritage has always been focused on solidarity with a woman in the in the policies that we do. We also do a lot of message testing that we share with elected officials and other okay. policymakers. We always lead with that because ultimately, why is it that we're pro-life? We, the, the royal we, all of right. us, obviously because of the sacred nature of every life, including the unborn, mm -hmm. but because of the dignity and beauty of womanhood. Right. And that I think we've really brought to life with the work we do at Heritage. Right. And, you know, and it's so important and so much can be lost in the sort of cacophony, right, of people. You know, what, what's so important is that people actually have research that backs up facts, right, so that, that we can, you know, look at policies and, and what will really help women and what is kind of just sort of a nice sort of window dressing, but at the end of the day doesn't really help. Um, um, what, what role do you see um, like government having in terms of providing services to women. Do you think this is really something that is more for private charities and private individuals, 
or should there be a, a wider and larger social safety net? Definitely the latter, which, which isn't to say that we want government programs of any sort for any purpose to crowd out civil society, which in right. fact has happened in, in other areas. But to, to remain focused on the needs of women and the unborn, I think about my favorite policy example of the last decade, really, when it comes to, to abortion. And it is during my time in Texas, leading a policy group there, legislators passed the famous, for us, right. Texas abortion law, but right. paired with that legislation. So from a guy who helps write legislation, right. I'll just nerd out for 30 seconds and yes, say, this please. is a good way to write legislation. Right. Right, right, right. Paired with that was a $100 million additional investment by the people of Texas right. and crisis pregnancy centers. Right. And it wasn't for government to provide those services directly, although that did happen. It was to underwrite the work of some of these, these nonprofits. I think that's a great model for those of us who call ourselves, politically speaking, conservatives, as opposed to libertarians, although I you know, have a lot of libertarian friends, that's one of the distinctions, is that we see a role for government in promoting the common good and the flourishing of each of, this, of, each of us. And I think that Texas law is just a terrific example mm -hmm. of that. And you know, I know um, Catholic Charities has been able to benefit from that. That's uh, right. The HUA, the Alternatives to Abortion Act, and they've even um, leveraged some of their private funding to extend it beyond age three to age five. So when the child starts kindergarten and then, you know, it helps the mom, the mom has a little bit of free time then and maybe more ability to work. But but let me just ask you a question because, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned in your Edify video is the incentivization of single parenthood and cutting fathers out. So how do we square that with being in radical solidarity with the woman, but also helping to bring the father into the conversation, the father of the child, helping to hold him accountable, but also, you know, hold him responsible for his child. Do you, is there a way to work those two things out? Because they seem to me kind of diametrically opposed. They are very diametrically opposed. And the, the, the short answer, I'll give you a little bit of a longer one, but just a little bit of one. But the, the short answer is there's a wonderful conversation among right of center and some centrist policy folks on what's called family policy. Mm -hmm. And for conservatives who are more oriented around limited government and free market, and God bless them, we, we need to continue to have that, especially now, they don't find this as, as uh, interesting as I do, but that's right. really going to be the answer. And, and I'll, to, to put some specificity on that, in the 1960s with the so-called Great Society and the so-called War on right. Poverty, right, right, right. basically the Great Society through our tax money, and maybe with good intentions, right. had terrible consequences on the family, and in particular families of color. And so as a, a historian who has specialized in the, the structure of the African-American family since the days of slavery, mm -hmm. I started reading the Moynihan Report and realized, gosh, something has changed. There was a time just to focus on black families when black dads were present. Oh, and there was a real black middle class. There was a huge yeah. black middle class and actually was one of the success stories amid all of the segregation yep. and warts in our no, history. No, in Chicago, we had a wonderful You know black that well. I mean, yep. Chicago is sort of the, the, the par excellence, the, mm -hmm. the example. But what happened was government money started coming in and literally disincentivizing right. men being present. Literally punishing women if they were married. You got more money if you weren't married. That's exactly right. And it, although I happen to think generally that politics and policy are down river, downstream from culture, mm -hmm. that is an example of how policy affected culture writ large because now every demographic group is fighting fatherlessness. Therefore, right. at Heritage, our scholars are working on what is going to be a very ambitious family policy in which we eliminate those provisions of disincentive, but also this is really important. I think Senator Rubio, among others, has been really thoughtful about this. We really need to think about incentivizing Americans without spending a tremendous amount of, of federal money to have intact families mm -hmm. for moms and dads to be present for their kids because ultimately there are a whole bunch of reasons to do, the, to do this, but just from a, a demographic standpoint, a sociological standpoint, we're not even replacing our population. And oh, we right. can't even have oh, a no. nation state yep. without and this. And that's what Elon Musk has been, you know. Uh, Personally uh, handling, right? Right, well, there you go. But also <laughs> talking about it quite, you know, in, in a very interesting way. He's very thoughtful about, about it. Yes, no, it's, it's so you're a big, you're a big proponent of time, uh, Title IX. I'm laughing because I love Title IX, growing up with sisters and, and, right. and, and having daughters, but I'm chuckling because the current administration is so misguided when it comes to some of the new provisions. Well, yeah, it's and, and what is a woman and, and yeah, who is exactly. and who and you know, I have been very grateful, frankly, for Martina Navratilova's really outspoken um, advocacy for keeping 
um, women's sports limited to biological women. She's a real hero. Yeah. I mean, she was and a hero for a lot of us our she's ages. Les- she's lesbian herself. That's right. So she is very much an advocate for that particular community. But, you know, talks about, no, if you if you have gone through puberty as a male, you have a greater lung capacity, you have different muscle mass, et cetera, as, you know, everybody knows. Um, but but tell me why your, your personal interest beyond having sisters and daughters um, in Title IX, why is it so important? It's important because I think it is an excellent example, one of the top two or three, along with the Civil Rights Act of, of the 1960s, of America getting it right, mm-hmm. that we guarantee equality of opportunity. We don't guarantee equality of outcome. In fact, right. that's rather unjust. Yeah. But Title IX, most simply for me as a historian and as, as an educator, guarantees that. The second thing is I've been a college president. We didn't have sports, mm-hmm. at least those kinds of sports, right. where I was. But Title IX would have been foisted upon us, and I, I use that verb for reasons I'll mention in a minute, were we to accept federal student loans and grants. Right. It has really been corrupted. I mean, that beautiful original vision of it has been right. corrupted. And so I think we need to remember, for those of us who are trying to reform it, that we remind everyone we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater mm-hmm. in our response to that corruption. In fact, it is the radical American left, which I just mean philosophically, not mm-hmm. politically, that is advocating for throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It is, it, it's terrible. I, I know so many women I work with, people in my own family who benefited from it, but those anecdotes mm-hmm. are merely anecdotes. For us as a society, right. it signals what we honor and we honor a quality of opportunity. And what we prioritize. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you're very experienced in higher education. Um, what can be done in a better way at the university level to make sure that there are there is space for pregnant and parenting students? Um, do you do you have any innovative ideas or you know there, there has to I, I know of some you know even Catholic schools that that aren't really able to accommodate students when they become pregnant and so there is no opportunity for them to continue their education. Can you just speak about that for a little bit? It's a very difficult issue from, I mean, obviously, but from the standpoint of logistics. And I want to be Mm -hmm. really clear, Mary, I'm not, this is a former college president actually faced with this issue. That's why I'm I'm interested. I was faced with this issue. I mean, humans are humans, right? Right. And and it was was logistically impossible for us to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. And so using that as as an instructive case for what I would argue to be a policy, we need to be better than Mm -hmm. that, right? And so what I learned from that experience, although I hope I'm never anything other than the president of the Heritage Foundation, were I to be a college president again, one of my priorities would be that there is a crisis pregnancy center, Mm -hmm. that there is also something similar for men, Mm -hmm. for young men to figure out how you go from being a 19-year-old not expecting to be a father to what that looks like. And then the third thing is, for us, it was housing. I mean, that that was the real issue. At at, at a brand new college where we were struggling to make ends meet, and that college is now fine financially and would probably be in better position. That's the kind of thing that needs to happen. And and although I would prefer civil society handle this, that is nonprofits, Mm -hmm. thinking about the vast majority of American students being at public universities as as I attended, maybe our pro-life legislators need to be thinking about provisions in the funding that they give to universities having that. Uh, I I just came up with that as sort of a light bulb moment. So maybe there's one policy stipulation that would be good. Feminists for Life, they have, have created this whole sort of college campus program where they try to serve as resources for college administrators. Um, what do you do when you have a pregnant student? I mean, I, you know, we, there's one scholarship that I'm aware of, it's called the Sister Thea Bowman Scholarship, named for an African-American nun, um, for single black parenting moms. And That's terrific. Isn't it, it is fantastic. And so we, I, I'm on the board of a pregnancy center in Chicago and we had a wonderful young woman who had lived in our maternity home for a couple of years, but we knew she had to get education in order to be able to support herself and her son. So we found this scholarship in all places in a very kind of small town in Minnesota. She has a four-year degree now. She is self-sufficient. She is independent. She's a beautiful little six-year-old boy. It all, But we need to replicate that across the country. And, you know, obviously, I, I, I refuse to accept this um, you know, this lie about the pro-life movement that we only care about babies until we're born. It is, it's not true. It's never been true. We have always attempted to, you know, leverage whatever resources we can to help women in need. But now that we're taking abortion off the table in a lot of different states, it's going to force people to think more creatively. It's, it's really important. And, you know, just to connect some dots in our conversation for one minute, 
you know, this wonderful custom that Ronald Reagan started in the presidential State of the Union, both presidents of both right. parties have used this with great effect. Yes. I mean, it's sort of right. our favorite part oh, of the State exactly. of the Union. No, exactly. Why? Because we see ourselves in those episodes, right? right? And and we, I mean, sometimes there are some partisan motivations there, but for the most part, these are our fellow yeah, Americans, right. right? It's your neighbors. It's the your next yeah. president, you know, maybe even our current president. Mm -hmm. you know, we could be praying to his guardian angel for this should feature women like this young lady yeah. who've seen their lives benefit because pro-lifers care about that baby from right. the moment of conception. Right, right, right. It was just trying to find the best possible outcome for her and her child. You know, Well, um, j just as we start to wrap up, tell me, faith and politics, some people think they should be completely separate. Why should our politics be informed by people of faith? Well, Christians generally, but for, for those of us who are Catholic, we know from church teaching, we don't have a choice there. It's a moral obligation right. to, to have them intertwine. Now, there are degrees of that, right? I'm, I'm more engaged in politics than what most people are called to be. But it's really important that Catholics understand more than ever mm -hmm. that the public square needs our witness. And I, I mentioned to many non-Catholic friends, too, because there's so many thoughtful Protestants on this, members of Congress. The reason I say this moment more than ever is because we understand the crossroads we're at mm -hmm. as a society. Yeah. But I want to let you know, and here's a dose of optimism about this, yeah. from someone who works every business day in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, there is a there are many people there, staff members, members of Congress, people working at associations, the Heritage Foundation, very faithful people mm -hmm. who quietly, discreetly, but very persistently have been witnessing to the truth and are right. living out the gospel commission. Right. My point is that for those of us who do that in DC, we're gonna continue doing that. But if in all of our communities, we are not forsaking politics and having summoning the courage even to just witness subtly in situations where it seems like it would not be the best, that really is going to allow us to reclaim this great country. Well, just in, in closing, is there a favorite scripture verse that you have that you turn to or a favorite patron saint that you rely on for as you go about your important work? I'll cheat and, and do both briefly. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 40, 31, I've been praying and reflecting on basically every day since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, of course, people very rightly talk about the New Testament and that's, we understand appropriate, but for me, that Old Testament verse about us soaring with eagle's wings has been a wonderful reminder to persevere mm -hmm. amid difficulties. And therefore, it leads me to my patron saint, St. John Paul the Great, who was the patron saint of my and my wife's reversion to the church. We're cultural oh, Catholics. Wonderful. And also the patron of the school we started and someone that I pray to and have benefited from his intercessions, I know, many times in my life. Yeah, no, he was, as Cardinal George, who I had the privilege of working for in Chicago, said he, he is the kind of person that comes along once in a generation, like once in a century, really, and that we had the privilege of having him for as long as we did, you know, it's, and I'd like to point out that Chicago was the first city that he visited. I knew you were going to say that, Mary. It was very important. He filled Grant Park, but what a legacy he left for the church and for the world. And I mean, the Lord always raises up people when we need them the most, but yeah, be not afraid, right? That's that's, that's exactly that's, right. And so. John, John Paul II is an inspiration to so many around the world who are not Catholic. Did you ever get to meet him? I didn't. No. When you go to the Heritage Foundation, you get off the elevator on one of our floors. We have pictures and statues of all right. kinds of luminaries. Right. Um, obviously, many of them not Catholic, but you get off the elevator on the fifth floor, which is our foreign policy floor. Mm. The first picture you see it's is John Paul II. We're not a Catholic institution. It's, it really signifies how important well, he is Well, right. I mean, us. he and Reagan and Margaret Thatcher kind exactly. of all at the same time working together. And, and had it not had the Lord not put the three of them in their very unique positions at the same time, I, I, the world would be a very different place, I think. So, very. well, blessings on your work at, at, you. at Heritage. Thank you for giving us so much time. Thank you for edifying us so that we can, uh, in, in turn, can edify the rest of society. It's a privilege. I'll do great work. And it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To make it easier for you to listen to future Edify podcast episodes, please make sure you subscribe over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you.